Hi, I'm Jess, and I am a resident here at Timberlake, and I'm working with the Young Adults Ministry. My name is Andrew. I've been a part of the group's ministry for about a year and a half now. I'm Katie, and I recently stepped into a worship director role after my residency here at Timberlake. My name is Isaiah. What I do here at Timberlake Church currently is young adults ministry and online ministry. The residency program has really given me an opportunity to, to see what it's like to be in ministry. It's never been something that I had uh, anticipated on doing. It really gave me the chance to see what it would be like to really answer a calling that is sincere to, to me. I started the residency program when I was still in college and it was a really great way for me to take what I was learning in class and be able to put it in a practical way, be able to apply that in a in a real setting. You know, even before I took on the position, I felt that I would be really valued. And that is true for my whole experience here. As a worship resident, I really got to see what it practically looks like to be a worship leader, to develop your worship team and serve every Sunday. It really helped me to step into and feel prepared for the worship director role. I've really enjoyed the community that I've gotten to be a part of here. The residency here allows me to take my experience in the classroom and apply it in the real world and really sets me up for success in ministry everywhere else. We regularly say that everything we do at Timberlake Church is mission, right? Because occasionally someone will say, well, how much money do we give to mission work? I say all of it. It goes here, near, or far. And one of the most uh, powerful, the biggest investments we make uh, here would be our residency program and investing in, in pastors and in leader, future church leaders. You know, they use the word ministry. Obviously, no matter where we're at, we can minister. We're in ministry, uh, at our, regardless of the workplace. But uh, what's obviously being alluded to in this um, video is the fact that, hey, pastoral work or church ministry. And if you've ever considered, maybe thought about the fact that, hey, I, I think that someday I might want to uh, be in church ministry. I, I might someday want to be a pastor. Maybe you're a young adult. Maybe you're in a season of life where you're like, man, I'm pretty much retired. Um, I've had employees like that. They just live like that. But uh, <laughs> no, you, but you're like, I, I'm pretty much retired and, and looking at the next season of my life. I encourage you, go to timberlakechurch.com slash residency and just explore more. We'd love to explore that with you as we continue to train up church leaders here, near, and far. Are you ready for today? It's Seafair Week, and I thought you'd have way more excitement than that. <laughs> Guys, thanks for being here in person. For those of you watching from home, maybe you're sick, you, you just, you've had a chaotic morning, we appreciate you gathering with us. For those of you watching from your boat, we hate you. We hate you. We're not even going to pretend, right? So here's the deal. Ever since the invention of the automobile, people have used their cars or vans or whatever to, uh, to promote different things, to market different things, or to convey humor, or political views, or tidbits of wisdom. And they try to do it in, in very limited amount of words. So, so since like the 1920s and 30s, if people wanted to advertise, they would put a sign on their car or a poster, and it would promote some sort of product. Um, but then in 1940s, something dramatically changed, and someone created what we know as the bumper sticker. And it took off, right? Because people love love, love to express their opinions and beliefs and their worldview in just a short amount of words. And bumper stickers took off because we didn't have social media. So this was the way to get it out to the world. And, and of course, bumper stickers are still around, not like they were 30, 40 years ago, but let, let, let's, let's look at some bumper stickers. Here's one you've probably seen. Be nice to your kids. They will choose your nursing home one day. That's actually, that's actually good wisdom. Uh, here's one from a creepy person. I'm the quiet neighbor with the big freezer. All right. Oh, Yeah. All right, for those of you who love Hallmark, you'll understand this. Honk if you fear losing your significant other to a hometown hunk with a kid who teaches them the true meaning of Christmas. All right, this last one, absolutely my favorite. Driver is old, can't hear, can't hear your horn, can't see your finger, have a nice day. <laughs> and you know they're old, because look at the size font they use on those stickers, right? <laughs> But bumper stickers, uh, the, the right ones at least, have the power to stir up emotions, to make you think, to make you laugh, or to even kind of stir up some anger inside of you. And what we're doing today is we are launching a brand new teaching series that we'll be in for a few weeks called Bumper Sticker Theology. Now, generally speaking, theology is a reference to the study of God. And the reason we're doing this series is because 
It's very tempting as followers of Jesus to take complex ideas about God, to take complex spiritual truths and to try to simplify them and narrow them down to just a few words. Sometimes that works, but often that does more harm than good. And one of the areas we see this do harm is when we see someone going through a very difficult time, it's very tempting for followers of Jesus to give a platitude or what we would call bumper sticker theology to try to encourage and motivate them. So we say things like, I know you're going through a difficult time, but you got to remember everything happens for a reason. Or I understand that you are stressed right now, but look at all your blessings. You're too blessed to be stressed. Or one thing I've heard over and over and over, I still don't totally know what it means, is when someone is just uh, overwhelmed and, and we say things like, well, let go and let God. Right? What, really, what does that, that mean? Or, God helps those who help themselves. And obviously there are, there's a reason that phrases like that are popular. They're spoken from a good heart. They're spoken with the right attitude. But unintentionally, when we use phrases like that, we can end up doing more harm than good. Again, the heart's right, but the message is wrong. All right, so 2008, my brother Rick is killed in Iraq. My mom is in her early stages of grieving. And my grandmother, so her mom, says to her, at least you have six other kids. <laughs> at least you have six other kids. As you can imagine, that did not help my mom's grieving process, right? My grandma meant well, but, and she's obviously, grandmas can get by with things nobody else can, but it, it conveyed something different than she intended. And we all do this from time to time. We use platitudes, we use cliches because we don't know how to deal with the tension of the moment and, and we want to say something, we just don't know what to say. And, and, and so what I want to do today is I want to zero in on a specific phrase that's very common for followers of Jesus to use when we see someone going through a difficult time. And again, right heart, but doesn't always convey what we really want it to. And the phrase is this, God won't give you more than you can handle. God won't allow you to get to a point in life you're so overwhelmed, so crushed by what you're going through that it destroys you mentally, emotionally, or physically. He won't allow the pain in your life to exceed your ability to endure that pain. That's a big statement when you consider the pains and the pressures of this life. Right? We've all experienced at times the pressure to perform, whether it's academically or athletically or with our work. Some of you have experienced the pressure of a relationship breakup and a separation and divorce and custody battles. Others have experienced the pressure of changing jobs and relocating from one city to another. I think all of us have gone through the pressure of feeling like we're juggling a million responsibilities and knowing there's not enough time to get it all done. Uh, there's pressure that comes from being a parent. There's a lot more pressure even that comes from being a single parent. There's pressure that comes from trying to manage depression or anxiety. There's pressure that comes from abuse or fearing for your safety. There's pressure that comes from being married or being in a long-term relationship. There's pressure that comes from aging or from health-related issues. There's certainly pressures that come when you try to blend a family together. And all of us know this. We've all experienced firsthand that when the pressures of life start adding up, it is overwhelming. And this idea that God won't give us more than we can handle, it's meant to be encouraging and motivational it sounds right, it sounds very spiritual, but at the end of the day, it's not true. Now, sometimes when we believe something that isn't true, it's not that big of a deal. Right back in the mid 90s when the internet was relatively new and they had AOL and dial up and all that stuff, I received an email one day from Hewlett Packard uh, informing me that I had won a laser printer. I never entered any contest, but I was like, yes, I'm in my early 20s. This is the first time I ever came across an email like this. I was like, oh, so it gave me a number to call and, uh, you know, the, the claim number. So I call Hewlett Packard and they're like, yeah, we get, we get calls like this all the time. That's, that's not true. That's a hoax out there. I'm like, oh, I felt dumb. Now, thankfully, since then, God's given me a great gift of wisdom. I've never fallen for a hoax ever since then. I, you know, but here's the, I felt really, that was, that was the end result. So I feel stupid. I try to be a lot more cautious now when I get emails from, you know, this prince in Nigeria and all this other stuff, right? <laughs> that being said, there are things, lies, that we can buy into that have big repercussions. So uh, Franz uh, Reichelt was an inventor who created something in the 1900s, early 1900s, called the parachute suit. Uh, he was a tailor, so he creates this. Uh, <laughs> That's a very elaborate design, right? But 1912, this is, this is so crazy to me. He receives permission to jump off the Eiffel Tower to test it out. Now, most of 
Franz is friends and family. I'm like, dude, you're an idiot. Do not do this. But he had made up his mind and he said, I intend to prove the worth of my invention. And so sure enough, he jumps. Tragically, the parachute does not work. He dies. And it's not a, it's not a feel good story here. He dies. It's just over. Well, the, the next day, there's a big article in the paper about this tragedy. And, and here's what it said about the moments following his death. There was nothing more to do but carry home the body of this inventor who had believed just a few seconds earlier to finally grasp fortune and glory. Franz went to his grave believing something that wasn't true. Now, the reason we're talking about this today is I do not want you to spend the rest of your life and eventually go to your grave believing something about God that isn't true. And so I'll let you know right from the beginning, I'm gonna sound like a broken record for a little bit. I'm gonna be very repetitive in what I'm saying. Because I've seen so many good, well-meaning followers that just believe and buy into this, this idea that, oh, God doesn't give us more than we can handle. And again, I understand why we say it. When we see someone in suffering, someone in pain, we don't like the tension. And so we have these platitudes. We say, well, you know, in the long run, this might be a blessing in disguise. Or God gives his toughest battles to his strongest soldiers. Or shake, 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 shake it off, baby. Right? Shake, shake, shake it off. The words and the phrases, they may vary, but the message is always the same, that God isn't gonna give you more than you can handle. And so I just wanna be clear, that's a lie. And if we convince ourselves it's true, what will inevitably happen is when we go through overwhelming seasons, we're gonna come to one of two conclusions. We're we're gonna believe that either A, we're failing, that our faith isn't working, that we did something wrong, now God isn't going to step in and help us, or B, God is failing, because he isn't gonna give me more than I can handle. This is obviously more than I can handle. So he is a million miles away, he's abandoned me. And what often happens when someone discovers that there is a gap between what they believe about God and their current reality is, is they either shut off their minds and just kind of be this, well, the Bible said it, I believe it, and it's true. And they just kind of live in la-la land. And we all met followers of Jesus who live in la-la land. Or the other extreme is they start to deconstruct their faith. So here's what I believe about God. This isn't happening. And now I'm going to just kind of tear this whole thing apart. So I'm going to be very, very clear. Unfortunately, sometimes we do experience more than we can handle. That won't be a best-selling bumper sticker, but it's the reality. And I don't like telling you that. I don't, it doesn't feel good to say, but sometimes we experience more than we can handle. In fact, it's, it's very easy to forget that some of the most godly men and women who've ever walked this planet, people we admire, that they got to a point in their life, they just weigh the white flag of surrender. They acknowledge, I'm done. Like I don't have the physical, the mental, the emotional capacity to keep going through what I'm going through. And nobody's immune from this. Sometimes we think, well, come on, that person's uber successful. They can just buy their way out of any problem. They can just network their way out of any problem. That is not true. In fact, in the first part of our Bible, we have this biography of a guy named Job. And right at the start of his story, here's what we learn about Job. That there was a man named Job who lived in the land of us. He was blameless, a man of complete integrity. He feared God. He stayed away from evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. He owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 teams of oxen, 500 female donkeys. He also had many servants. He was, in fact, the richest person in that entire area. Job's the epitome of the person we all want to be, right? He loves God. He's a person of character. He has a great reputation. He has friends and family that love him. And compared to everyone in his area, he's incredibly wealthy. So regardless of how you want to define success, he fits that definition at some level. He's successful in every way. He's living his best life. But then as we read his story, just a few paragraphs in, we realize he's hit with a series of losses, financial loss, loss of family members, the loss of his health. And in the midst of his losses, he makes a very bold proclamation. He says, the Lord gave me what I had and the Lord has taken it away. Praise the name of the Lord. Really, Joel? And the guy must be on gummies or something. He's just got this aloof attitude of like, oh, it's all good. The Lord gave me what I had taken away. And I'm like, dude, none of us would respond that way. But he does. He's super optimistic. He's idealistic. But then the losses start piling up. And days start turning into weeks. And weeks start turning into months. And his attitude starts to change. And his perspective starts to change. And he goes from this attitude of worship, which is basically bring it on. I'm ready to eventually comes to this conclusion. I would rather be strangled 
Rather die than suffer like this. I hate my life and don't want to go on living. I feel like that every time I'm sitting in traffic on the east side, right? But Job has friends who in this season, they just come sit with him and they, they try to help him make sense of what he's going through. And eventually he turns to them and he acknowledges depression haunts my days. I've said this before. I'm convinced that most people, most of us are prepared for days or even weeks of difficulty and disappointment. But I am also convinced that none of us are prepared for months or years of difficulty and disappointment. We all have different thresholds of pain, but none of us are designed to carry pain and stress and worry and difficulty for an unlimited amount of time. When we're overwhelmed, we need to know that there is light at the end of the tunnel. The problem is when we're overwhelmed, we don't see the light. Successful people are not exempt from this, but neither are powerful people. Right, because we all have people in mind that we could think of that they, like if they were faced with a crisis, they're just resilient. These people are type A, they're driven, they just go, go, go. Nothing could stop them. They are warriors. Well, in our Bible, every time you know, that we're reading a story of King David, it does seem for the most part, not every time, but for the most part, that this dude's a warrior. He had a big reputation for being a warrior. He was strong, he was resilient, he had courage. But like I said, it's, it's almost every time. There were stories of, Everything seems to be unraveling for King David. Everything's falling apart. And in those seasons, he would just write out prayers. Here's a sample from one of his prayers when he's overwhelmed. He says, God, please listen and answer me for I am overwhelmed by my troubles. There's a song of worship that we sing here at Timberlake. It's about the goodness of God. It's a great song, but then it has this line in there. You're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let me down. And every time we sing it, I'm like, oh, he does let me down. I wanna take the mic right now and say, no, he's let me down many, many times. And he's let you down many, many times. But the perspective of that song is, hey, at some point we get to in our lives and hopefully we can look back and say, hey, even though I hated that season, even though I would never wanna go through that season again, I look and realize God was with me in it and he got me through. But in the moment, he it definitely feels like he's letting us down. And so in this prayer that David is writing out, this, this little sample we're looking at, he goes on to acknowledge. He says, fear and trembling overwhelm me, and I can't stop shaking. Because life's filled with pain. It's filled with heartache. And we could try to explain away. Sometimes it's a result of living in a broken world. It just is what it is. Other times it's a result of a decision someone made. And now we're experiencing the shrapnel of those, those decisions. Sometimes the pain and ongoing suffering is a result of our own dumb decisions. Things that we did, now we're experiencing the consequences. Uh, there was uh, one season in which King David made a series of destructive decisions that hurt a whole lot of people. And as he lived with the aftermath of his decisions, here's what he admitted to God in, in a prayer he wrote out. He said, my guilt overwhelms me. It's a burden too heavy to bear. He doesn't say, God gives, doesn't give me more than I can handle. He said, no, it's too heavy. I'm exhausted. I'm completely crushed. My, my groans come from an anguished heart. Unfortunately, sometimes we experience more than we can handle. Successful people get overwhelmed. Powerful people get overwhelmed. And, and this isn't some sort of theology we can fit onto a bumper sticker, but even Jesus experienced moments in which he was overwhelmed. And think about that. God in the flesh, Jesus to take on human flesh. He experienced pressures and difficulties and pains and temptations in overwhelming ways. Matter of fact, we read that just before he was arrested and tried and convicted and crucified, just before all that unfolded in his life, that he was in a garden praying with some of his disciples and he looks to them and here's what we read. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. He knew what it was like to be overwhelmed. And it's why one of the last things that he said to his 12 disciples in the last 24 hours as he's talking to them, he, he says this, here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. He just made it clear, you're gonna have pain. And when the trials and sorrows of life start to add up, it's gonna deplete us emotionally and mentally and, and physically. And at some point we will begin to break. And if you have bought into this idea that following Jesus is supposed to end in a stress-free, problem-free, you know, uh, pain-free life, it's going to wreck you. Anytime that there is a gap between expectations and reality, there's an emotional breakdown that starts to happen. And we've experienced this, all of us in different areas of life. How many times have we started a job? It's like, oh, this is the greatest job ever. I can't believe it. I won the lottery. 
And it's like two months later, I, I, I hate these people. Right? Or marriage, you get married and you just can't stop wiping your tears. You're just like, I'm so in love. You hear some of these vows and you're like, oh gosh, oh gosh. Right? It was like four years in the marriage, you're like, I hate them. I hate them. I hate them. Right? <laughs> we see this with Disney. Disney's amazing with marketing. I've seen so many commercials over the years that you have like Disney World, Disneyland, they're all the same, right? You got Mickey standing there in Main Street and some family approaching him, he hugs the kids and he walks hand in hand through the park and everybody's laughing and the weather is always perfect, right? No crowds, there's no waiting in line for rides. Everybody's just smiling and getting along. It's like, what loving parent would not do this for their kids? And I wanted to show you a commercial from the mid nineties, but I, I don't know copyright laws and if we'd be flagged on, you know, the different uh, media outlets we use, but I did screenshot something from this, right? This is at the end of the day at one of their parks, Disney World. And you see Mickey just hugging this girl. And what do you got here? About 12 people <laughs> looking, <laughs> looking at this, right? I've, I've been to Disney a, a bunch. And when it comes to Mickey, there's always a 20 or 30 minute line, right? It's always packed. It's always uncomfortable. In fact, my wife and I went a couple years ago. Here's a picture of us looking at the castle at the end of the day. Look at all those people. That's the reality. And we may be smiling, but it's exhausting. And if you've gone with kids, I'm sure you've been like us, right? At the end of the day, you don't have boundless energy and playfulness like the family and the TV ads. Instead, at the end of the day, we were always exhausted. We were carrying a couple passed out kids to their room and we were calling a marriage counseling hotline. That's what we were doing. And if life is that hard at Disney, believe me, it's much harder in the real world. There are going to be seasons of life that are too much for us to handle. And again, I know I'm sounding like a broken record and I'm super repetitive just because of how much we've been fed this message. God won't give you more than you can eat. He won't give you more than eat. He won't allow it. He won't allow it. He won't allow it. And I want you to be very aware of this. When you are overwhelmed with the pain and with the stresses of life, there is nothing wrong with you and there's nothing wrong with God. We live in a broken world. There are gonna be times where it feels like our world's out of control, but it does not mean that God is out of control. So let me ask a very important question. If God does love us, if he deeply loves us, why would he allow pain and suffering? Why would he allow it? And why doesn't he just protect us from all of it? And the simple answer is, I don't know. I, don't, I think anything I say is gonna be like, oh, that's bumper sticker theology, right? And I wanna be very respectful to you right now who are in a season that is overwhelming, in a season where you're just being crushed by stress. And I don't wanna give you bumper sticker theology. So I do not know why God allows these things and be able to explain every answer. What I do know is God never wastes a hurt. What I do know is God can bring good out of bad. What I do know is God can take the ashes of our life and make something beautiful and meaningful from them. And so at the risk of minimizing what you're going through, which is not my heart, and the risk of sounding like bumper sticker theology, let me give you just a few thoughts today. If we were never overwhelmed, I think it's true that we would never learn to depend on God. Right? When I'm overwhelmed, that's when I'm just like, oh dear God, get involved. If we never experienced financial difficulty, we never went through any loss, never had anything in our life that surfaced doubts or questions, never went through the breakdown of a friendship or a relationship, never forced to uh, juggle a chaotic, out of control schedule, never experienced mental health issues, emotional health issues. Right? If we never went through that, the reality is we would have very little need to depend on God. And the longer I follow Jesus, the more convinced I am that one of the reasons he doesn't always protect us from the pressures of life is he understands we need to be reminded of our humanity. That doesn't make what we go through any easier to, to know that, but it, but it kind of gives us a little glimpse, right? Because we live in this world of motivational phrases and quotes and you can do it if you put your mind to it and, and we're just inspired and we need those things. Those things are not bad. I appreciate those messages, but we have limitations. Physical, financial, mental. We have time limitations. We have energy limitations, all types of, of limitations. And when the pressures of life start to exceed the limitations in our life, instead of thinking that there's something wrong with us because we can't carry the stress or pain of this any longer, when we're overwhelmed, it should just be a reminder of our humanity in that we are not all powerful. We need help. In the first century, the apostle Paul writes to followers of Jesus living in Corinth, which is part of modern day Greece. And he describes some of the challenges that he and some of his team had gone through in trying to bring the hope of Jesus to as many people as possible. Here's what, here's what Paul writes. He says, we think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure. 
We thought we would never live through it. In fact, we expected to die. But as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely on God. I can't even tell you how many people over the years I have met in settings like this who show up to church services who say, I'm here because my marriage is falling apart. Right? God's never been on the radar of my life. I mean, I've known about God, but it's never been a part of my, but I just lost a, a parent. I just lost a sibling. And I just, I am wondering about the afterlife. I'm just, and so the, the, there's something about this where we start to open our hearts and I've heard a quote a couple of different times. And for the most part, it's attributed to a pastor by the name of Rick Warren. Um, and here's where it goes. You, you don't realize that God is all you need until God is all you have. I know it sounds cliche, right? It sounds like a platitude. But the whole point is when we're overwhelmed and it seems like nothing else is working, what often happens is it positions us to turn our hearts towards God in a way that we don't typically turn towards him in any other time. King David admits to doing this in his life. In fact, King David uh, alludes to hardships. He alludes to misery that he's going through. And and he he writes about his response. In, In one of his writings, he says, but in my distress, I cried to the Lord. Yes, I prayed to my God for help. Well, of course he did. It's what we all do. It's very true. You can experience God on the mountaintop. You don't need to be in some valley. But I do know this, that for most of us, we experience him most when we're in the valley because that's when our hearts are positioned towards him. And when we turn our hearts toward God, we have unique opportunities to see him in ways we don't normally see him. We have unique opportunities to experience his power in ways we typically wouldn't. If you're in a toxic work environment, there's certainly going to be seasons in which you experience more than you can handle. If you're a foster parent, there will be seasons in which you experience more than you can handle. If you're raising teenagers, right? There's going to be seasons in which you experience more than you can handle. If you're a Seahawks fan, you, right? If you're married, there's going to be seasons in which you experience more than you can handle. And sometimes I'm convinced the reason we're so overwhelmed is the pressure we put on ourselves. I used to think without question. I used to think, man, I got to be strong for my wife. I got to be strong for my kids. I got to be strong for you, the, the church. I got to be strong for our staff. I got to be strong for my friends. I got to be strong. For, I just got to be strong, strong, strong. That's a lie. The truth is, if I want to be healthy, I actually have to be aware of my weaknesses and my limitations and my brokenness. Because those are the things that push me to go before God and say, God, I can't do this. I need you to step in. I need supernatural strength. I need you to give me wisdom. When we're overwhelmed, we tend to turn toward God. I mean, as a pastor, do you want me to be the pastor who never has any doubts, never has any questions, really arrogant and say, guys, I know where we're going and I know what we need to do to get there. So get on board. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Or do you want a pastor who says, hey, I'll just admit, I haven't got it all figured out. I've got my weaknesses. I've got my struggles. I've got my issues. Here's what they are. But all of that is pushing me into this position of where I'm praying more and more and saying, God, I need you to supernaturally come through. I need you to do what I cannot do. Because ultimately, that's what's going to get our church to where we need to be. Something else to think about is if we're never overwhelmed, our growth would be stunted. Think about the character traits we admire in others. The reason they have those traits isn't because they were born with them. It's because difficulty in being pushed out of comfort zone developed some of those traits. Patience, kindness, compassion, grace. If we never give our kids responsibility and we shielded them from all, they would never grow. This morning, just before our first uh, gathering, I ran into a couple who just had their first baby. And I look at them and I say, welcome to the season of your life where you are going to grow more than you ever thought possible. Having a kid is going to mature you because now you have to think about someone other than yourself. If God only allowed things into our life that we could handle we would be stunted in our growth. This is why James, the the brother of Jesus, writes to followers of Jesus going through persecution. It seems like he's really insensitive, but here's what he says. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Often the pain, the loss, the difficulty, the discomfort in life causes us to grow or helps us grow. One more thing to think about is if we're overwhelmed, we would be limited in our ability to help others. If I had never had any marriage problems, if I never had any parenting issues, 
right? If I had never had any financial struggles, every week I would just stand up here and give you platitudes. Guys, you gotta let go and let God. All right, God doesn't give you more than you can handle. Come on, we can do this. But it's the struggles in life that bring us together, that allows empathy to develop. Who better to help an alcoholic than someone who's experienced battles with alcohol? Who better, better to help someone struggling with mental health than someone who's battling mental health, but just has figured out some tools to kind of manage it? Who better to help someone in a difficult season of marriage than someone who's experienced a painful and difficult season in their own marriage? There's so many examples of this. I mean, I could spend days just giving you story after story. Let me just give you one, Dave Reaver, right? 1969, Dave is on a tour of duty in Vietnam. He's preparing to throw a phosphorus grenade and tragically it explodes in his hand. It burns him beyond recognition. He's 21 years old, his life has changed forever. He looks in the mirror, feels like he's looking at a monster. He has to go into surgery after surgery after surgery after surgery. He spends, he could spend the rest of his life just locked in a house saying, I'm just not gonna deal with humanity. But instead he, he just had this attitude, God, I wanna use this. And so he starts speaking to kids just a little bit younger than him in high school, high school assemblies. And then he starts speaking at various gatherings to adults. And today Dave is in his seventies. And in my opinion, still one of the most effective communicators in this country. And the reason why is because Dave is very open, very candid in sharing about the loneliness and the pain and the challenges he experienced because of his scarred body. And the message he gives over and over in different ways is that he may have scars on the outside, but he says a lot of you struggle and have scars on the inside. And I've heard Dave speak so many times and after every time he speaks, there's 30, 40, 50 people who will line up to speak to him. They feel like, oh, this guy resonates. This guy knows me, he gets me. When the apostle Paul writes to followers of Jesus living in Corinth, in the first century, he makes it clear. He says this, that God comforts us in all our troubles. He comforts us in different ways. Sometimes he brings people in our life. Sometimes he gives us supernatural strength to get through. He comforts us in different ways, but he does it, why? So that we can just feel better? No, so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. Without ever experiencing overwhelming pain or loss or difficulty, we would never really have to depend on God. Our growth would be stunted and we would be very limited in our ability to truly help others. I'm not suggesting pain is good. I'm not suggesting we should seek it out. Believe me, there's enough pain that just comes into our life without us seeking it out. But I do want you to know God can bring good from it. And so today is just a message of hope. And if you're going through a difficult season, may God give you the strength to keep pressing through. May he surround you with people. Don't buy in this lie. Well, you can handle it all. You can't. This is why we need the church family. This is why we, we need God so desperately. We're gonna end today by receiving communion together. So I encourage you to take out the elements that maybe uh, hopefully you received on your way in, some juice and a cracker. Recently, my wife and I spent some time in the city of Ephesus. Right, we visited the different remains of temples and museums, lots of gods and goddesses, and they're all these statues that convey strength and power and courage. So much to admire, but what they lacked was the ability to connect with people in a personal way. And this is why in the ancient world, everybody was afraid of the gods and goddesses, and they always felt like we gotta do something to be okay with them. And so they would bring offerings and make sacrifices to say, hey, we're good. I want you to know that the God we serve does resonate with us and can relate to us on a personal level. Because 2000 years ago, the God of this world became one of us, took on human flesh, experienced pain, experienced suffering, and eventually experienced a death on a cross. And, and for us, if, if we've heard the story before, it doesn't even sound that, that moving or revolutionary the way that people living in the first century would have experienced it. Because in that, they're living in a time where with the gods and goddesses, they, they don't, try to connect with you, you try to connect with them. You try to do something. That's why you bring your offerings. That's why you make sacrifices at an altar. But what they discovered is it was an exhausting system. It was messy, it was expensive, because it wasn't like you could just bring something to the altar, make a sacrifice and then be gone. No, you had to come back the next day or the next week or the next month or at some point, you know, in some cases the next year, but you always had to come back and bring another offering because you knew that you were never totally free of guilt and free of sin. At the end of the day, what humans discovered is sin was too much for us to handle, too exhausting, too much involved. So the God of this world handled it for us. When Jesus was crucified, it was a message 
that became clear to this world. That the God of this world, instead of making demands of sacrifices from us to be okay with him, he would be the sacrifice once and for all. He would provide forgiveness of sins, past, present, and future. All we need to do is open our hearts and say, I believe, I put my faith in you, not me. We obviously don't have physical altars that we would bring sacrifices to, but yet we use the word altars from time to time as a way of referencing bringing something to Jesus. But here's the deal. Instead of bringing a sacrifice of all the good things that we do, you know, even sometimes we say, well, we sacrifice ourselves to Jesus. That's great. But what are we really sacrificing? We're sacrificing our sins, our weaknesses, our shortcomings, and our brokenness. That's all we really have to offer. But God receives us arms wide open. And we're actually going to sing in just a moment a song that references that and talks about how when we come to God, we're always met with arms of love and grace. Before we sing that song, though, I do want to receive communion. The wafer, the cracker that we eat represents the body of Jesus broken on a cross and the juice represents his blood. Let's receive that now. Would you stand with me and I'm going to pray. Our heavenly father, We thank you for your grace, for your mercy. We thank you that instead of demanding sacrifices from us at some altar, that you became the sacrifice. Today, once again, we put our hope, we put our trust, we put our faith in you and not ourselves. We pray for our friends, our family, for those in this room, for those watching online or listening online. Pray for those going through a season in which they're overwhelmed and they're being crushed. May they sense your presence in a real way, in a powerful way. Lord, I pray, give them the wisdom on how to navigate the season, surround them with people who can carry their burdens and supernaturally do what you are only able to do and empowering them and strengthening them because we can't handle this life on our own. We do need you. So we put our faith and our hope in you. In Jesus' name, amen.